Gaddafi is gone, now officially dead and buried, but just how he and more than 50 of his supporters died lives on. With evidence emerging of summary executions of Gaddafi loyalists, did the NTC actually have control over its fighters during those final chaotic weeks of battle? Or does 40 years of brutality and repression perhaps justify such acts? The end of Gaddafi, just the start of the investigation. This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. The stories of just how the former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi died have been many and varied, but one particular comment I think sticks out, and it may unintentionally be pointing us in an important direction as far as any further investigation into those deaths goes. The comment was from the man himself, Gaddafi, who asked his captors, quote, do you know right from wrong? A bit rich, perhaps, coming from him, some would say, but it does raise the question about how Libya's fighters, the National Transitional Council, conducted themselves in not just Gaddafi's final moments, but those of dozens of others. As Gaddafi was buried at an undisclosed location at dawn on Tuesday, the NTC did bow to international pressure and announce a committee to investigate how he and his son were killed. The NTC's head, Mustafa Abdul Jalil, still held to the initial explanation that Gaddafi may have been killed in crossfire a view many of his officials do not appear to believe. Then there is a report from Human Rights Watch pointing to evidence of atrocities against captured Gaddafi supporters, 53 of them, some bound and shot in the head, found on the lawn of an abandoned hotel in the city of Sirt. So it raises questions, doesn't it, about what's right or wrong, if we can use those phrases in the fog of war, but also about what sort of future Libya's government and armed forces will have if this indeed is the foot they've gotten off on. Let's introduce our panel to discuss this today. Great team today, starting in London with Ali Ibrahimi, who is a research fellow at the London School of Economics. Here in Doha is Wahid Bershan, a representative from the Libyan National Transitional Council. Uh, and also back in London, David Mepham, who is the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. And I thank you all for joining us today on Inside Story. Uh, lots of things to talk about. We'll talk about these executions, apparent executions in a moment. I want to start with, with Colonel Gaddafi uh, himself. And seeing as we've got Wahid Burshan from the NTC here with us in Doha, let's start with you. Uh, there have been, as I pointed out at the start of the program, so many different versions about what happened and all the cell phone video we saw and the different claims and counterclaims. Do you believe a definitive story will come out of this investigation? I mean, clearly what uh, these pictures show is that Gaddafi was alive and um, when he was arrested. Um, and, um, and you saw those statements of his. And clearly um, what's important about this is that he uh, shows later on that he was dead. Uh, we don't know the time between when they arrested him and the time he was shown he's dead. Uh, but it is important to, to see, we, do, we don't see the actual execution um, or if there was an execution or, or his, the way he died. Um, but it is something for the NTC and I think uh, Mr. Abdul Jalil uh, made the announcement yesterday that uh, that needs to be investigated and I think that's in process uh, to determine that. Uh, I must say also uh, to explain uh, the environment that this thing happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to provide an excuse or anything like that, but it's very, very important to understand this is a battlefield. These are young men um, uh, in, in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of a battle that uh, shows that, that they were surprised to see Gaddafi and uh, uh, the fervor of war and the fervor of what's happening uh, that they saw him. You know, somebody may have done something. I, I don't know. Um, but the investigation is, is uh, it's warranted and it's, it needs to be done. No, and I think it's a good point, and I'll put it to David Meffin from Human Rights Watch over in London, not to take sides at all in this argument, but I think Mr. Boroshana makes a good point. This wasn't a, a sophisticated uh, war machine. This probably happened quite by chance, and really the NTC uh, leaders themselves probably knew very little about how it all actually went down, and then we get all these different stories that come out from the field anyway. It may well be right that this was not something that the NTC leadership authorised or approved of at all. I think what's absolutely important, and the representative of the NTC has made this point well, is that there needs to be a very thorough investigation of how Gaddafi, Muhammad Gaddafi, and also his son and others were killed in those few hours. I mean, clearly there are, there's lots of video footage, there's footage that suggests that he was being, he'd been captured, and then we know that he was, he was killed. So we need to get to the bottom of that. I think that's important in terms of 
the future course of the new Libya? Can Libya make a real break with the past, the sort of bloody and repressive 42 years of Muammar Gaddafi that we're all familiar with and some more of the detail of that terrible repression that he was responsible for needs to come out and be properly documented. But this is the opportunity to move on from that and say that the future Libya is going to be a very different kind of place where international law, basic, the basic rule of law is, is respected. And I think how the NTC responds both to this question of the investigation into Gaddafi's death but also into the broader case of pro-Gaddafi forces that appear to have been killed and dumped in a mm. Uh, part of a hotel that Human Rights Watch researchers drew attention to. That also needs to be thoroughly investigated. And we will come on to that in a moment. Before I go to Ali Ibrahimi in London, I just want us to have a listen to something. It's another theory, actually, and it comes directly from the head of the, NT of the NTC, uh, Mustafa Abdul Jalil, who throws forward the idea that Gaddafi might have actually been killed by his own supporters. Have a quick listen. We have already formed a committee to investigate the circumstances surrounding Gaddafi's death. But let's question who has any interest in the fact that Gaddafi would not be put on trial. All Libyans want to try him for what he did to them. Um, Ali Ibrahimi, I'll bring you into the conversation now. He actually went on mm -hmm. to say, we didn't have it on tape, but he did go on to talk about you know, those who wanted him killed were those loyal to him and played a role under him. Their death was perhaps to his benefit. Uh, a crazy idea or, or a possibility? You know, um, anything is possible. Um, I just think it's probably not as constructive to focus on that kind of theory, which isn't necessarily backed up by the evidence right now. Because I think this isn't detrimental. This isn't disastrous for the National Transitional Council in and of itself. I think, to be fair, they have been heralding, um, you know, a more forgiving and forward-thinking brand of politics in their willingness to accommodate members, former members of the Gaddafi regime in the council, but also in their attempts to offer negotiation before the last assaults at Bani Ulid and at Sirt. Mm. So, you know, they had made a lot of progress in terms of breaking away from the methods of the past, but this, of course, undermines it dramatically. But where the national transitional itself becomes responsible is not so much for the actions of what might have been just the actions of a few sort of rogue elements. Um, I think it's their messaging, and I think that statement from Jalil is probably an instance of that. Their messaging has been clear, um, unclear and confused, and it isn't instilling that much confidence. But the notion that they can be responsible um, and that their campaign is entirely subverted or diminished by the actions of some rogue elements I don't think is fair because, you know, even in the West, our armies, which are professional, modern armies with a very embedded military culture, have committed some egregious uh, actions in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And I think that the way in which you can reclaim your moral authority is through a full and, and, and proper investigation. In, in the end, Ali, and, and this is where we'll just leave the point on Gaddafi before we move on to the other executions. Mm -hmm. Could we have expected anything else? You talk about these rogue elements. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if you're out on the battlefield and you've got a young fighter who's been fighting for six months, more than six months, who finds Gaddafi, it, it would be almost difficult mm -hmm. to ask him to be restrained. Absolutely. Um, in fairness, you know, that, that, that comment is absolutely appropriate, I think, in this context. And that's, that's you know, uh, part of the passion that was involved in the way in which he was handled is indicative of, of the whole event and the way in which it was structured. These were people, these were private citizens that were motivated by their own feelings and emotions and opposition to Gaddafi to rise up and to take arms. This wasn't a standing, a professional army. And in that sense, you know, I think the context is slightly mitigating. And of course, the 40 years of, of dictatorship um, is, is in itself brutalizing. Mm. So, you know, as long as this wasn't systematic on the part of the National Transitional Council in terms of directives, then, you know, I think, as you say, there are some, some mitigating circumstances. Sure, and, and we will talk more about, if, if you like, the moral arguments uh, a little bit later on this program. I want to move now to the Human Rights Watch uh, report, which David Meffham uh, introduced earlier, the talk of mm. upwards of 50... Uh, pro-Gaddafi supporters, and I will ask you about this, David, uh, found some of them bound, uh, shot in the head, and this is on a, on a, on a hotel lawn in Sirt. Um, this is clearly not, if it is proved, not regular battle. It's not crossfire. I mean, is it soldiers or fighters getting carried away, or do you think it goes beyond that? Again, I think it's unclear, and I think it's absolutely essential that the NTC should properly investigate this. In some ways, this is, for me, even more concerning than the manner in which Colonel Gaddafi was killed. Um, there are 53 people. There are further 10, actually, that were dumped in a reservoir not far from the hotel. So this is a significant number of people who, and you mentioned this in the introduction, some of whom appeared to have been 
had their hands tied behind their backs with kind of plastic tape and so on. They were all dumped in one kind of group. Some of their bodies were in a state of decomposition, suggesting they may have been killed maybe over a week ago. Very concerning. What were the circumstances in which these people were killed? Who was responsible for it? Is the NTC genuinely going to get to the, the, the bottom of, of who was responsible and hold those people accountable? I mean, clearly, there's prima facie evidence that, that certain war crimes may have been committed here, and it's absolutely essential, again, for the for the way that the new Libya, the sort of direction for the new Libya, that these, these cases should be investigated independently and thoroughly. Wahid Borshan from uh, the NTC, spokesman from the NTC, we were discussing this in our editorial meeting earlier today, the fact that, and we've touched it on this already, the NTC fighters, they're not what you would call properly trained soldiers. They may not have known better about, if I can say, the rules of engagement. Do you think that argument actually holds water or that someone who is fighting on a battlefield should know what killing in battle is and execution is? I, I think it's uh, even more than that. As, as, as Libyans, uh, our culture and, uh, and, and our religion for sure does not uh, support such, uh, such thinking. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, knowing f wrong from right is, is, is valid in this point. I mean, this is something uh, unexplainable. This is, this is, I agree to totally that this is separate than the Gaddafi situation. Hmm. This is, uh, if this has happened the way it's been described, this is a cold murder and I think it needs to be investigated. There's no question about that. that is, there's things very, very clear to us, uh, NTC, and I, I'm sure all the Libyans would, uh, would not support uh, or even explain such a, such a situation. Uh, these guys or these soldiers, also Libyans, whatever the circumstances brought them to that situation, they were murdered. And uh, it's their rights, their, uh, their, our responsibility as NTC is to investigate it thoroughly and explain why this has happened and who is in charge and so on and so forth. So I'm fully supportive of this. And I know this is not the culture of the NTC. This is not the mindset of our uh, 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 people, our fighters. Uh, these are loving freedom uh, uh, people that they want to free their country from a tyrant. These are, uh, in a way, they are the victims themselves. However, the way that's been done, it's not something that we, we should be standing by and just look over. We need to investigate it thoroughly. Clearly, uh, the way you speak, you, you, you know that investigating is important and that transparency will be yes. very important. But do you see this as sort of, a, um, and the way I phrased it before, was a tough foot to get off on? You're only just into the process of liberating the country and taking it forward and already having to answer so many very negative questions. Well, I, I know, I, I think there will be a lot of challenges along the way. I mean, the, 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 the way we inherited the country and the way the country is being shared, we're going to have more than this. Things are going to happen. What's important is that our, the way we deal with them the way we structure things, the way we make decisions, the way we show ourselves first and the rest of the world that we are new branded people that come in uh, charge of a country that's looking forward to build itself. We cannot, we cannot leave these small things aside and consider them well just a matter of happening and, and just mull over them. We, we need to investigate them. David Meffin, do you like what you're hearing from Wahid Boshan there as a, as a representative from the NTC? I, I do. I think, I think I think what's been said is absolutely right. I, I, I like that approach. I think it's, it's absolutely essential and necessary. And you know, the, the rest of the world, to some extent, is going to be looking and watching and hoping that there is follow through on those words and that there is this proper investigative uh, process that actually gets to the truth of this. I think that's absolutely critical. Let's move on to, and, and I flagged this up earlier, the moral argument, if you like, where we're not dealing in the black and white here, we're dealing with, I guess, emotions in what has been a very emotive time. Ali Ibrahimi, I'll come back to you. Can we dare turn this into a good guys versus bad guys situation? Because I think people might be initially surprised when they hear the likes of Human Rights Watch and, and United Nations calling for investigations into Gaddafi's death. They might think, well, maybe he, you know, he had what was coming to him. He was, he was roundly seen as the bad guy. Or can there be more acceptance when bad things happen to the bad guys? So generally, um, you know, that takes you into the, the areas of, of subjectiveness and moral subjectivity. And, you know, our point on those of us who would be on the side of human rights and seeking to augment human rights structures and regimens around the world is that everybody shares them and that you can't apply them selectively. Mm -hmm. And I think that if this is the basis on, upon which Libya wants to move forward, then we have to accept that even in cases such as Colonel Gaddafi, certain rights do apply, they're, they're non-derogable and they apply categorically. So I think it's very morally dangerous to start picking and choosing. And I think that's something probably, hopefully, both the other panelists would accept. Uh, well, let's find out. David Meffin. 
I do. I, I, I fear there's an awful lot of consensus in this discussion so far. I completely <laughs> agree with what's just been said. That there are basic things that it's it's wrong to do to somebody no matter what, and that people are entitled to no matter what. That's what human rights are about. And you can be the worst kind of tyrant, but still there are certain things it's not permissible to do to you. And you have those rights that ought to be upheld in all circumstances. So I think the, the introductory point that you made, though, about the need to get beyond the kind of goodies and baddies approach is, is what we need in Libya and arguably what we need across the whole of the Arab world, that what we want are basic institutions to be developed that can uphold people's rights, that can ensure there's a proper process when it comes to judicial matters, ensure that everyone has an opportunity to shape the future governance of their country. It's those institutional development questions that I think are going to be very important for Libya over the next few months and years. In getting those institutions bedded in, going with the grain of Libyan society, of course, but ensuring that people's rights are upheld and respected. Well, Hid Bashan, is it hard to put that good guys versus bad guys argument to the side? I know I'm, I am being very subjective here, but I'm doing it on purpose because it is a highly emotive battle. Muammar Gaddafi was in power for 40 years and was seen, uh, the word dictator was used a lot of the time. Uh, how do you, when you're uh, with a group like the NTC, which in some ways was a bit of a disparate group, try to keep the focus away from the good guys and the bad guys? or the perceived good guys and the bad guys? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think there's a huge elements of that uh, in terms of understanding who's uh, the good guy and the bad guy in, in, in every situation. I think that's, that's uh, our sense of morality and our sense of understanding what justice means and so on. I think that's definitely it's within us. And I think it's important, and I'm, I want to add to the discussion, mm -hmm. is that uh, I, uh, the things that I don't like or I hope that doesn't happen is the international community would look at Libyan with a sort of like a lower standard kind of morality, I mean, uh, of, uh, of advanced countries. We need to put Libya to high standards. I look to myself and to my people to put ourselves to a higher scale um, and of, of morality, and we need to do the right things all over. If we did, we did not go through all of this just to for a substandard of, of moral code or uh, justice. You know, we, we need to look for what's what's best in us, and we need to put what's bad about us. And whatever we do to uh, something and, and means we we dealing with it. So, and I hope I described it cor correctly. But that's that's the, the the feeling that I we have. No, nicely put it was too. Let's look, as we start to run down the clock, look at the future of, of what will be the next Libyan government, the next Libyan armed forces. You, you've all touched on this in a way already, but I want to go down a little bit deeper. And I will go back to Ali Ibrahimi, first of all, because you made the point in your first answer about the fact that this doesn't... Uh, the, these uh, alleged human rights abuses, they don't necessarily 100% condemn the NTC because, as we've established, it was a very big group and perhaps didn't have control over all its, its factions. That said, it shows mm -hmm. that the onus really is on the NTC to get some control there and to bring the, the, the fighters, the weapons, under some sort of umbrella. Absolutely. You know, conflict in Libya is not in any way inevitable. I think it is increasingly looking probable, as you mentioned, with all of these arms and, and heavy armaments now floating around, but it's in no way inevitable. There are plenty of promising things in Libya's favor, not to mention its, its huge resources, its highly educated and highly technical population, um, its, its very clear and sophisticated plans for developing the economy, which have been elaborated over many years in the Libya 2025 vision, and uh, its good, its excellent international relations at the moment, apart from maybe with Algeria and some other African countries that have lost a patron. But this is really a moment of opportunity. And I think that analogies with Iraq are thoroughly misplaced, mm -hmm. where the problem was actually structural, where you had a foreign invasion, you had whole-scale debuffification, and you had the perception that the Americans had come along, taken power from one segment, the Sunni, and given it to the Shia. And I think that created the conditions for, for conflict and terrible conflict. In Libya, it's much more promising. I think there's a moment here, um, but it's going to take a lot of leadership. It's going to take courageous leadership and it's going to take a lot of tough decisions. But if the council becomes more representative and if it, if it um, develops an inbuilt way of accommodating differences of opinion, then I think the future needn't, needn't be bleak at all and on the contrary. But of course, the first step to that is disarmament. And that's where you may get um, sort of power struggles starting to come to the fore. There will eventually, though, have to be a, a future Libyan armed force, a, a, an army, if you like. Who does the NTC turned to for uh, cohesion, for training, to make that a proper force? 
I think the NTC has got a number of, of military sort of commanders, a couple that, that um, defected from Gaddafi's regime that could probably uh, hasten that and lead that process by integrating all of the existing militias into uh, an armed forces and to train them and equip them and give them this more kind of um, civic, kind of um, holistic, unified spirit. And also I believe that there was some uh, talk of integrating some of them into the uh, interior ministry. So I think that there's the potential there, but there's going to be a lot of dialogue that has to go on and a lot of politicking to get some of these guys to move into some sort of uni unified command structure. And I think in that regard, the next uh, three to four weeks are critical. And they'll need to, David Meffham, if I put this to you, they'll need to be trained, if you like, in the ways of human mm. rights and taught on the battlefield, this is what happens and this is what doesn't happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. I mean, one other issue that I would add to the ones that have already been mentioned, I mean, I agree about the problem of you know, arms proliferation. Arms are very prevalent across Libya. Um, I agree about the need to get a, a grip on these sort of local armed groups and there to be a kind of unified command before too long in terms of the, the, the army of the country. One other issue that Human Rights Watch has, has been following, which is of concern to us, is the way in which um, Africans that are living in Libya, for Africans from elsewhere in the continent, mm -hmm. have been treated. And there's quite a significant number of them that have been t detained and held without any charge being brought. That's a concern too, as well as the extrajudicial, apparent extrajudicial executions that we've talked about earlier on in this interview. There is the question of hundreds, if not thousands, of black Africans and dark-skinned Libyans that have been held. And I think, again, another important priority for the NTC is to address that and try very quickly to put a basic structure of justice in place that says that people, you know, a, a case is brought against them or they're released. But holding people indefinitely without any charge being brought again is a, is a big problem. Wahid Burshan, uh, you are as an NTC spokesman listening to what our other two guests have to say. It sounds like you've got a lot of work ahead of you. We sure do. <laughs> and uh, at first, I mean, we need to acknowledge our responsibility here. You know, we, there's so much we can say, well, we are, it's out of our control and things like that. And, and, and I think it is, but I'm, I'm trying not to give ourselves excuse or room because we really have, uh, we shouldn't have any tolerance for any of this. I think there's a, a large element of ignorance is, uh, in, in place right now. Uh, there's a lot of things that needs to be discussed uh, uh, and, and, and hard decisions needs to be made. What do you um, mean by ignorance, Wahid? I think there's a lot of ignorance in the community um, and, and our, in, in the population that uh, the, the dark skin uh, individuals are pro Gaddafi and uh, looked at it with suspicion and I think that's definitely there. What needs to be done is explain what exactly happened, what are those people, if there are some people came from Africa and the way they were recruited and they were, they were managed and believe me, some of them didn't even want it to be. Some of them did. Some of them are definitely uh, uh, pro-Gaddafi and they wanted to fight the fight and so on. But we need to explain to the people who, is, who are they, whether they're gone or they're still here, are they among the population or not. There need to be a better explanation of the environment now so no one can take the law uh, in their hands and do something uh, of, of the sort. And if there is such a suspicion that there is a process, they need to explain to them whether they take them to the police or the security apparatus or whatever. But somebody needs to start talking about these things immediately. Well, hey, do you think history will be kind to the National Transitional Council when years back we look on this in these six or seven months and look back on it? <coughs> will it look at, at black and white or will it acknowledge the huge gray area that existed? No, I, I think uh, the, 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 what they have done, um, and uh, it's, it's been great, and I must say, under the circumstances, under the situation they're, they're in. Obviously, in any environment like this, there have got to be challenges, there got to be issues that come to, to bear. But what you need to have, that moral guidance that you have to have, the decision-making process needs to be correct, based on certain, um, uh, certain uh, uh, policies and, and codes. If you do that, whatever the outcome you know, may be looked at positively. Um, the fact that uh, the challenges are it's not of their control, it's something the, the environment is presented to them. What's important is that how they deal with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, so far under what they have to deal with under the environment, I think it's been uh, fantastic in my view. What a great discussion this has been. A lot of agreement, as David said, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. My thanks to Ali Abrahimi in London, Wahid Burshan uh, here in Doha, and also David Meffam in London. Thank you. And to you, our viewers, as well, thank you for joining us for this edition of Inside Story. If you've got a comment or your suggestion to send us, hop on the email. InsideStory at AlJazeera.com is our email address. From the whole team, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>